undermining public confidence in the FBI. First there was Ruby Ridge and Waco. There's an ingrained arrogance and it feeds this attitude that we can do no wrong. Then came problems at the crime lab, the Wen Ho Lee investigation and the Hansen spy case. I call it a cowboy culture. It's kind of a culture that puts uh, image, public relations and headlines ahead of the fundamentals of the FBI. And now, the missing McVeigh file. Over and over again, these embarrassments go back to Louis Free, his decisions or lack of decisions. Tonight, the FBI and its director under fire. If you're of a certain age, chances are you grew up to stories of the FBI as those relentless G-men, wearing gray suits, short haircuts, and wingtip shoes. They were as neat as insurance salesmen, as upright as clergymen, and they always got their man. And this image was no accident. Longtime director J. Edgar Hoover had a simple rule for his agents, don't embarrass the Bureau. The FBI hasn't been living up to that standard for a long time now, but the last few years have been especially rough. There's been a steady stream of embarrassments, from the shootout at Ruby Ridge, to the botched investigation of Wen Ho Lee, to the revelation that a top FBI agent was really a Russian spy. But last week may have topped them all. Just six days before the government was to execute Tim McVeigh, the FBI announced it had failed to turn over stacks of documents to McVeigh's defense team. This after agents had been asked five separate times to turn over all the papers. What's wrong with the FBI? Nightline's Chris Bury begins our coverage. Perhaps no other American institution has a more carefully crafted image than the FBI. Throughout the Bureau's 66-year history, Don't shoot, G-Man. its agents have been portrayed in the popular culture as heroes who always get the bad guys. Freeze! Put your hands over your head! But the FBI's glaring mistake in the McVeigh case, the latest in a litany of Bureau embarrassments, is taking a toll on that vaunted reputation. And it is clearly testing the patience of Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike. Congress is probably the only agency which has the authority to get to the bottom of it. And if we find deliberate concealment, that's obstruction of justice and people ought to go to jail. When you have on major case after major case after major case, uh, mistake after mistake after mistake, it's time for a thorough and complete re-examination. I think there's a management culture here that's at fault. I call it a cowboy culture. The FBI's failure to turn over more than 3,000 pages of documents is producing new legal maneuvering. Lawyers for Terry Nichols, serving life for his role in the Oklahoma City bombing, are now asking the Supreme Court to reconsider his appeal. Today at the Justice Department, investigators were still sorting out exactly why those documents surfaced so late, according to ABC News correspondent Pierre Thomas. By February, the FBI clerks who were working on the Oklahoma City bombing case, archiving all the files in connection with the case, knew they had some type of problem. By March, they told the FBI supervisor of the case he was skeptical. He wanted more work done before he knew it was a major problem. The critical question is, when did the FBI supervisor know for certain that this was a massive problem, and when did he tell supervisors? The embarrassments are piling up. From the FBI's difficulty in rooting out spy Robert Hansen from its own ranks, to the bungled cases against Los Alamos scientist Wen Ho Lee and Atlanta bombing suspect Richard Jewell, to the front page of today's Boston Globe. It details plans for two massive lawsuits against the FBI for protecting informants, members of Boston's Irish-American mob, knowing they were involved in murder and extortion. Today, Paul Kelly, a former federal prosecutor, filed a preliminary claim demanding the FBI pay $600 million to families of the mobster's victims. They crossed the line in a substantial way and engaged in really reckless, outrageous conduct, 
where they became cozy and, and friendly with these informants. They not only looked the other way when, when really t tremendous crimes of violence were committed, but they also leaked sensitive law enforcement information. The difficulty for Congress and the media alike is in connecting the dots. Has the Bureau merely been cursed with an unfortunate but unrelated series of mishaps? Or is there truly a pattern of deep-seated trouble at the FBI? The pattern has been that over and over again these embarrassments go back to Louis Free, his decisions or lack of decisions. Ronald Kessler, a journalist who has written extensively on the FBI, puts the blame squarely on outgoing director Louis Free. It was Free, Kessler argues, who personally pressed the high-profile investigation of Richard Jewell in the Atlanta Olympic bombing. Free, who pushed the prosecution of Wen Ho Lee, and Free, who resisted a recommendation for regular polygraphs that might have discovered FBI mole Robert Hansen. The Bureau is, is very, very responsive to the director. Uh, it's not this, this uh, culture of, of you know, ignoring uh, the leadership. And if the director wants something, uh, it's done. And if the director doesn't want something, it's not done. And uh, I believe that, that in most of these cases, you, you see a connection to Louis Free. The Bureau runs the director rather than the other way around. Chris Kolesnik, a former congressional investigator, blames an ingrained arrogance in the agency's culture one that existed long before Louis Free and will likely outlast him. If they went where the science went, or took them, they'd have cases wrapped up like you can't believe very, very quickly. That's, that's the kind of brain power they have. That's the kind of resources they have in technology. They could do it. The problem is they don't focus on that. That's the secondary issue. The primary issue is let's build the image of the FBI. More mob-related lawsuits have been filed against the Boston office of the FBI. But allegations like those made today against the Boston office of the FBI don't fit any particular pattern, according to the former federal prosecutor who's now going after the Bureau in court. I have great respect for the FBI and, and the men and women of the FBI. I, I truly believe that the conduct in, in this, these two cases is an aberration. I don't believe it's reflective of most of the honest, hardworking agents of the FBI. Uh, I don't think it's reflective of the FBI of today. Well, I think the FBI has lost a lot of credibility, and they, they look like a bunch of bumblers, and uh, that ultimately impedes their effectiveness because they need the cooperation of the public. Indeed, the public image of the FBI, so respected for so many years, is taking a beating. The long list of recent stumbles makes its agents look less like Hollywood heroes than Keystone cops. And Congress, clearly unhappy about it, wants to hear an explanation from Director Free when he testifies later this week. This is Chris Bury for Nightline in Washington. By the way, the FBI declined our invitation to appear on tonight's broadcast. When we come back, how bad a hit is the nation's premier law enforcement agency taking? and how to right the ship in a moment. Joining us here in Washington, Iowa, Senator Chuck Grassley, a member of the Judiciary Committee and a longtime critic of the FBI. And Elsa Walsh, a writer for the New Yorker magazine who had unusual access to FBI Director Free for a profile published last week. And in New York, Michael Bromwich, who was Inspector General for the Justice Department from 1994 to 99, he conducted investigations into allegations of misconduct and incompetence at the FBI. Senator Grassley, I want to start with this intriguing phrase that you keep using, a cowboy culture at the FBI, putting image over fundamentals. How does that explain what's happened, not only with McVeigh, but also Wen Ho Lee and Waco and Robert Hansen? Well, you might think it would be uh, judge free, but I don't think free is the issue. I think the issue here is a culture that's very uh, deeply embedded within the FBI, a management culture that is uh, more related to public relations and headlines uh, and less concerned about uh, fundamentals. And the fundamental is that the FBI, when it seeks the truth and let the truth stand on its uh, own two feet, it does a very good job. But when it's uh, in high-profile cases, when it's only concerned about its image, 
uh, that's where things go wrong. And I think that's a major problem on these high profile cases uh, that it's concerned about its image more than substance. And there's an arrogance about it as well. Uh, Senator, the implication of what you're saying seems to be that the that the FBI is more interested in making, quote, big scores than it is in worrying about people's rights. I think in a few cases that's true, and your program thus far has highlighted those cases, so I don't need to repeat them. But there's a certain consistency in all those cases in which uh, there's a, a, a lead agent uh, and there are careers made or broken in these particular cases, uh, and corners have been cut, uh, and the evidence uh, somewhat uh, uh, twisted. And, and in that regard, uh, I think it's, it's an effort to uh, produce an outcome rather than letting the truth and the investigation speak for itself and stand on its own two feet to convict. Uh, Mr. Bromwich, you've been critical of the structure of the FBI, and I want to get to that a little bit later, but, but this cowboy culture that the senator talks about, do you also see that in the FBI? I'm not sure I would share that characterization. But I do agree with the senator that there do appear to be problems that arise in uh, some of the larger cases. I think that has a, a specific kind of explanation. One of the things the Bureau does best is to throw lots of people and lots of resources uh, at unsolved crimes in an effort to get uh, the perpetrators of those crimes. The problem is that that kind of massive effort generates a tremendous amount of paperwork that the Bureau then seems to have trouble collecting uh, and retrieving when the time comes to respond to court orders to turn over information to the defense because there's such a mass of material that no one or two or three people uh, have all of the knowledge relevant to draw all of the information together. But, but also, so I think, there I, mean, are okay. I think there are structural problems with those big cases that create special But, but Elsa concern. Walsh, let me, let me break in here for a moment because some of the criticism has been more personal than that as we heard in, in Chris Bury's piece. You had this extraordinary access to Director Louis Free for a year and you just heard this, this argument that he was pushing, he was behind some of these high profile disasters. Well listen, there are very legitimate criticisms that you can make of the FBI and of Free. I thought that the um, introduction was very one-sided though. Um, in particular I think you need to look at the bigger picture. Take the McVeigh case, for example. Um, you forgot to mention in the piece that uh, McVeigh has acknowledged that, in fact, he was responsible for the bombings. Um, so what we're talking about in this <coughs> McVeigh evidence sort of missing case is uh, Michael Bromwich alluded to it that uh, there was a massive amount of documents that were collected. I think there were about a billion pages of it, and there are 3,000 that they didn't end up turning over mistakenly. That's um, <coughs> three for every million, uh, three pages missing for every million pages collected. Um, as far as I can tell from what people tell me there, most of these um, pages are things that are not at all what they call exculpatory, things that would go to the innocence or guilt of, of, of Mr. McVeigh. <coughs> there are things that came in in the first couple of days, a lot of people calling in about weird sightings and things of that sort. Um, so again, you've got to go back. What's the big picture? He did say he did it. And I also think that um, if you look at the FBI during Free's tenure, you'd have to come away from it saying the FBI is a better place since Free has arrived there. Um, there have been many um, high profile investigations that were also highly successful. The Oklahoma City bombing, in fact, it was a successful one. I think that people in the Bureau say that Free is walking around numb saying, how did this happen? This should have been a huge you know, success story for us. Um, last week in The New Yorker, I wrote about a piece which Free calls his most important investigation, which was the investigation into the terrorist bombing in 1996 in Saudi Arabia of a <coughs> military facility. They feel they've solved that case and have asked the administration for in the indictments of senior Iranian government officials, a case that nobody thought anybody could solve. All right, we have to take a break here, but when we return, I want to ask you all about the, the string of mishaps and uh, whether or not Louis Free should have survived them this many years. And we'll continue our discussion in a moment. And we're back now with Senator Chuck Grassley, journalist Elsa Walsh, and former Justice Department Inspector General Michael Bromwich. Senator Grassley, as we say, there have been a series of mishaps during uh, Louis Free's tenure. Truth to tell, has he gotten a pretty easy pass from Congress? Well, but part of it is Congress's fault because we have a constitutional responsibility of oversight. That's how the checks and balances system of our government is working. 
And uh, Louis Free is a very personal fellow, very uh, energetic. He's done a lot of good uh, as director. But let me say one thing. He, one of his talents uh, is to come up and schmooze with Congress. Uh, he's very political disarming. And congressmen just kind of melt and, uh, quite frankly, uh, not do their job of asking the tough questions. Now, when we have asked the tough questions and pointed out things that were wrong, and it's all these cases that you're talking about on this program, uh, he tended to take action. But I think the fault was that he tended to take action when these things were pointed out and he was pushed into it. Senator, is, is part of the reason that there was so much melting going on on Capitol Hill because Louis Free made it clear to congressional Republicans that he was as if or more critical of Bill Clinton than they were? Well, that may have been a small part of it. I think it's just generally that uh, Congress, whether it's generals coming up here with their ribbons on their chest or Louis Free, uh, there's a tendency uh, to be intimidated rather than doing the job of oversight that is our constitutional responsibility. And I think that we've got to concentrate on this, whether we have a Republican president or a Democrat president. Elsa Walsh, how good a political infighter is Louis Free? How adept has he been in being able to negotiate through the string of embarrassments? Well, uh, Louis Free understands the importance of uh, personal relationships. He said to me that's the most important thing usually in an investigation, and he, I think he applies that in all areas of his, of his life, except perhaps with Bill Clinton. Um, one of the things that I think helped him a lot in Congress, and Senator Grassley can probably talk about this, is that whenever there was a, a problem pointed out to him, he usually did do something to fix it and did, didn't sort of shy away from saying, yes, we made a, a big mistake. With this whole problem with the information in the McVeigh case, which Michael Bromwich could talk about, it was in part a problem that the computer infrastructure at the FBI is totally dysfunctional and in terrible shambles, so old that many of the parts they can't buy to replace, when they break, they can't buy replacement parts. Free in 1996 um, saw this problem, um, went over to the OMB, went over to Justice Department and said, listen, we need a new computer infrastructure. We need the money. And in it, in his talking points, he had, he had listed a number of cases which he said could be significantly damaged because the computer system was so bad. Among those cases that he listed was Oklahoma City. That money was not released really from Congress until November of 2000. M Mr. Bromwich, let, let me get you into that because I have to say, in all honesty, I don't get this co computer problem. I mean, Elsa has made the point that even at 3,000 pieces of paper is still a very small percentage of the total number that was turned over. But in this day and age, how complicated is it to file everything that's involved with the Oklahoma City bombing under Oklahoma City bombing? Well, I, I think it is a complicated issue, the, the ways in which their computer systems are defective. On the other hand, the defects in that system have been known for a long time. And one of the ma management challenges that w has not been effectively faced is how to deal with those deficiencies in the short and medium run while you're handling big cases. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the percentage of documents is that wasn't produced. The fact is you have 3,000 pages of documents that weren't spread across 46 separate offices of the FBI. I think it's very difficult to minimize uh, the management failure that that represents. Uh, you know, Mr. Bromwich, you have called the FBI a series of fiefdoms where people don't share information. How bad is it? Well, I think there's a tremendous amount of control exercised by the individual special agents in charge in the different field offices. Uh, and they have a tremendous amount of control over the cases that are run by their offices. And there is a resistance in many cases to centralized control, including centralized data management control. And we're seeing the costs of that right here. Senator Grassley, how much trouble is the FBI in right now? And what does it need in its next director? Well, first of all, I wrote a letter to the president today outlining a lot of things I think that ought to be taken into consideration, but it all boils down to somebody who is a strong individual from the outside who's going to take a bull by the horns and challenge this management culture of arrogance and make the changes that need to be made and be in control and uh, make sure that they emphasize that we're going to be only concerned about the product. And I think one of the major things in uh, personnel uh, uh, guidance when you uh, grade people is that we need to grade them more on the objectivity of their work.
than we presently do. Now, some people point out that the last three appointees have all been judges and that what you need is, is a real manager, maybe a law enforcement manager, to run this huge bureaucracy. Well, uh, that's a suggestion I made for the IRS and President Clinton followed it. We've got a person who's n not a tax lawyer running that agency and I think he's doing a much better job. I'm not going to say that that same pattern would fit for the FBI, but it's got to be somebody who is strong and willing to challenge uh, the, uh, the, the bureaucracy. Elsa, I, I think Elsa, go, ahead, yes? go ahead. I was going to ask Elsa Walsh, uh, what do you think the FBI needs in its next director from what you've seen? Well, I think Louis Free should withdraw his resignation and stay on for another couple of years and fix the problem that's there. And Michael Bromwich? Uh, I think that uh, the Bureau needs two things. One is somebody with a demonstrated uh, record in law enforcement, and second, as Senator Grassley indicates, someone with a track record for management. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Michael Bromwich, uh, Senator Grassley, Elsa Walsh, thank you all very much for joining us. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. And I'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, George Stephanopoulos begins a series on race, the changing face of America. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Chris Wallace in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.